Hi, uh, we are back with Olaf um, for a follow-up episode. So how about getting started directly here? Uh, have we seen any legal cases or any been, been any lawsuits? Uh, around open hardware? Yeah. No. Uh, so I talked to Andrew Katz, who is the main authority on, on this matter, and he told me that there have been no court cases, at least that he's not aware of. Um, and I think I think he would he would know. Okay. So I have a question here for for, for me as a soft software developer. I, I get the feeling that you're looking down at me because I only know software and you probably know both, but there you go. So what is it that, that is free is um, or or open? So is the uh, uh, can, can you explain it again for me? Yes. Yeah, so uh, as as a software developer, I, I hear this question a lot. Uh, many software developers are interested and want to get started somehow. They are not really sure where to start, and and that is is one of the main problems here. That it is perceived as two very different worlds, uh, where in reality much of the uh, actual work uh, could be done in a much more software-centric way, uh, and I think this would make it easier for software developers to, to come into the field. And we're getting there, but very, very slowly. Uh, and there's also a bit of different mentality. Uh, I have when, when I went to school, there was a lot of talk that we don't use program lang languages. We use hardware description languages, and that is a much more something... Uh, more advanced, uh, I think, was the implication of that. Well, in reality, I think it's just an extremely bad excuse for not keeping up with, with modern software practices. The tooling in the open source silicon world is, is and, and methodologies are 20 years behind that in, in software. Uh, so uh, there, there's, there's no reason you should be uh, feel, feeling bad, I think. What we should see instead is that software developers will be able to come in with modern software development practices, and we should listen to that uh, because you have much more, uh, you're much more advanced in, uh, than we are in our field. Um, but that, then again, it's what you want to do. It all depends on what you want to do. So if you want to create functionality in Silicon, uh, then you would probably learn Verilog, or you would learn VHDL, or you would learn uh, one of the newer languages like Chisel or uh, Nmigen or um, uh, Clash, which are different uh, newer so, uh, hardware description languages. No, no or you can work... C these days? Once again? No System C these days? <laughs> system C is, is, is interesting because it, it has been around for ages, and in some quarters it's very popular. Uh, and in other quarters, it's just never too cold. Um, so I, I, I always been a bit curious about System C. It's there, but it's not everywhere. Yeah. Uh, so, so, but, uh, but, so the, the uh, sil silicon functionality, the IP course, is one thing. But then also a lot of it is tooling. When the stuff I do, I do mostly work in Python, creating tools for working with these designs, such as Fusok or Idealize. Um, so, so there's there's a lot of it is pure software, just targeting uh, silicon. But I see it a bit from from my old like uh, I used to be a teacher, and uh, when I taught programming to students, uh, they went for like one course, a second course, and then perhaps in the third course uh, we use some kind of graphical library so they could do a graphical user interface. Ah, this is programming, they said. So for me, program is as soon as as soon as you see something like "Hello Cleveland" or something on the screen, I, I'm you're fine. This is a program, but for me, it's hard like to see what would be the corresponding "Hello Cleveland" or "Hello World" in in hardware. That is blinking a LED. I, I yeah. was about to say the same. <laughs> it's starting your blink LED. And exactly. I actually have a have a project called uh, "Led to Believe." Uh, which is is an attempt to to make uh, 
make project files for all FPGA development boards in the world uh, so that you can easily get started with, with a simple uh, linking project and, and, and take it from there. So it currently has support for 52 different FPGA boards, uh, but there are there are more needed. And it's also a good thing if people are getting started out in the field, they can just apply a patch. It's, it's pretty easy, uh, and they can feel good adding support for their board or, or trying out uh, an existing board. Is that on, on GitHub or somewhere? So it's like... Yes, it's on GitHub. Super. I guess we can uh... I will put a link in the show notes. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so, uh, how many of these tools are, are free or open source? C can I do I have to buy a license from a hardware vendor company? Uh, in most cases, you don't need to pay anything. Uh, and when it comes to FPGA development, uh, an increasing number of uh, FPGA now have uh, fully open source tool flows. They are still in my minority. Uh, the first that uh, got widespread uh, acceptance was the Lattice Ice 40 FPGAs. These are very small FPGAs uh, that were documented by Claire Wolf mostly. Uh, and we have, after that, we saw also from Lattice ECP5 uh, chips. I think that was mostly Dave Shaw doing that. Uh, we have now seen some support for various Silinx devices. Uh, there's work ongoing on, on other Lattice devices, on uh, Intel FPGAs, on Goin FPGAs. Um, so it, in some cases, you can find fully open source tool chains. These are never <laughs> endorsed by the FPGA vendors, except for one case, which I will return to. <laughs> um, but it, there are almost always uh, Free as in beer uh, vendor tool chain you can you can get for your devices. Yeah, and speaking about beer, I remember you kindly together with uh, Jonas, if I remember correctly, and uh, for sure Julius uh, visited the conference I co-organized, FSCOS down in Gothenburg, and this is uh, I have a note here saying 2012. And we had a hazy night with lots of beer, and we we discussed this. And back then, it was, you had to buy. Uh, oh, it, the community was clearly not as vibrant as it is now. So it, it's kind of cool to follow uh, the work you do. That is very true. So we have had open source CPUs for for twenty years now. Uh, starting with the Open Risk project, and we have had open tools, some tools uh, like simulators, like Verilator and uh, Icarus Verilog. They have been around for 20, 25 years. There's even been open source ASIC tooling in in some way for for 25 years or so. But the community is really, really coming together uh, the past few years, and also Risk Five has been a big catalyst. Risk Five is in itself not an open source project. It's a it's an open it's a, it's a royalty free standard. Uh, but uh, the it has had a tremendous impact on on the on the interest in this field and interest in open source silicon. Yeah, Risk Five is interesting. I mean, we we had a talk on on Foss North from from Mirko Berm about standards versus open source, and it's you kind of approach the problem from from different perspectives if, if you're implementing something as an open source reference standard or if you're actually doing a standard standard as, as you used to um but risk five is is a standard standard so to speak with with different <laughs> you're talking like my kids you, you, you <laughs> either it's standard or it's not standard there is no such thing as standard standard here come standard. on <laughs> <laughs> standard proper <laughs> <laughs> No, but it, are, are there commercial implementations of Risk Five as well? And the, yes, this, yep. So uh, Risk Five started out as um, as a university project, uh, as, as a base ISA base base uh, instruction set for doing other types of research, um, and it was. I mean, there's so much computer architecture research going on in the world, and, and in many cases, there are some professors who think it's fun to make their own instruction set, so they do that and, and force the students to use it. 
Uh, and this has been a problem because that has zero use in the real world. Uh, but this one was very well designed. It was uh, also co-designed by uh, David Patterson, who kind of invented the RISC uh, architecture uh, back in the days, which started MIPS and, and everything. Um, so they open sourced it and they pushed it uh, and they tried to get industry acceptance. And I think that was, was very much the key and the world was ready for it. So uh, today, so the first implementations were open source. Uh, and, but over the years, there are, I guess there are now more uh, proprietary um, risk five course being, being in use than, than uh, open source ones. But, but so you share the the ISA, which I guess mean that then you can share all the tooling, like Clang and GCC and operating systems and and all of that. Yes, and that that is that is the the big thing. So you have the freedom to innovate on 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 either side. So you have a lot of software people who are uh, very interested in in helping out here. We just had the V8 port, the JavaScript engine, uh, just landed upstream, uh, which is a big thing. Uh, we had Android support uh, for first time a couple of weeks ago from um, Alibaba's hardware uh, section, which is called this T head, I think they're called. Um, and then on the hardware side, you have you have an I ISA, which uh, is a very simple base ISA. Uh, but where you have extensions that you can implement for to, to tune your, your CPU for different use cases. So for example, if you want to build a very small CPU, you might only stick to the uh, base instruction set. If you want to make a um, compute heavy one, you might add the vector extensions. Uh, if, if you're doing a, a Unix capable CPU, you want to add the hyper hypervisor uh, parts and, and uh, atomic operations and things like that. So you can mix and match all these extensions and uh, and uh, build a CPU that follows the RISC-V specification, but is very well tuned for, for your application. And just backing off one step there, so, so I mean, when instruction sets or ISAs, as we put it, that, that's like x86 versus ARM. So, so you can't run a PC program on an ARM device and the other way around. And RISC-V is, is yes, another instruction set. And, and when it comes to these extensions, then it's a bit like uh, you have ARM hard float, for instance, if you do floating point calculations in hardware, otherwise you have to do it in software. Uh, so I guess it's a very similar setup where you have extensions like uh, MMX and, and whatnot that you can detect and either do in software or hardware. Yeah, that's correct. That's the way to describe it. Yeah. So, so what's the... Well, I guess the trade-off that you're looking for then is sort of size of silicon and versus functionality. So if you do something simple, you can do like a microcontroller that uses the RISC-V world tooling, but you can also do something fancy. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the idea is to have something that scales from the smallest microcontrollers that you will find in deeply embedded things like power management controllers or, or just something that uh, they cakes counts button presses or, or something uh, up to smaller embedded systems like uh, routers or, or phones, which are already getting very advanced, up to desks to computers and all the way up to um, high performance computing like data centers and, and uh, supercomputers. But how does it look on the on the other side then? So, so you have the whole software tooling, uh, all of that set up. And you have the ISA and you have the CPU. Do, does it define like a standard bus as well or sort of? use something for, for peripherals, or is the integration always sort of a one-off? No, no. Uh, so RISC-V only describes the instruction set, uh, and that is, is very well well um, contained to, to uh, do that. On the other hand, there are other organizations like Chips Alliance, which I am also a member of, uh, that tries to take a more holistic approach. Uh, and pushes other types of standard related to this. So uh, in the Chips Alliance project, uh, for example, Western Digital has um, given away the uh, Omni Extend specification, which is a bus protocol that builds on the uh, TyLink bus, which is originally from Sci-5 and now also in part of Chips Alliance. Um, and it, it, it provides cache coherency over Ethernet. 
So this is one such bus specification that is, is now being driven as, as an open standard. Uh, also, Intel is, is part of the uh, Chips Alliance. They are pushing the open uh, the open AIB chiplet standard. So chiplets is a very interesting thing. Uh, I think will uh, play a big role in, in the future. It's, it's kind of like instead of having one chip and, and then or instead of having a lot of chips on a on a PCB on a circuit board, you will have small dies and then put mostly all of the circuit board inside a chip and mix and match uh, different functionality to build up a chip that that but it's it's actually physical dies that you then connect with bonding wires or something it's not like ip blocks that you use to create an asic no so you you create these chiplets uh, uh standalone and then you can combine them uh, through a standard specification like the AIB specification and that I think will will change the way uh, chip design is chips are made I mean my soldering skills went out of use when when surface mounted came so I guess this is this is the next level proper <laughs> this is yeah yeah really it's, it's all about miniaturization uh, and, and cost efficiency and, and power efficiency and, and all that comes with it I mean that's the reason why things are getting smaller it's to be able to cram more things into smaller area and make it more power efficient but you, you mentioned that there are multiple implementations that, that actually the commercial ones are or the closed source one are, are more common when it comes to to risk five implementations uh, what, what are the big ones uh, yeah so the the probably the biggest one i think is uh, andes it's a taiwanese uh, company that used to have I, i'm not sure i got my history right here but i think they had their own uh, cpu architecture and then they made a big bet on risk 5 uh, so they provide uh, the, the price services around the cell cpus and the cell integration around it so that you can you can easily put their uh, cores into your devices and then of course the sci5 uh, which is uh, founded by the uh, founders of the risk 5 uh, uh, spec which is uh, chris dasanovic uh, jan Supli, and andrew waterman um, and we have, for example, Codasip, which has a very interesting model. They have their own uh, proprietary Risk Five CPUs. Then they also provide commercial support around the uh, open source uh, course that Western Digital has uh, provided through the Chips Alliance project. Uh, also, the uh, Swerve, as the course are called, in the Swerve support package, you also get access to Fusoc, which is a uh, good thing to have. Um, so it, uh, there are many more. Uh, for example, NVIDIA uh, has famously uh, replaced all their internal CPUs with uh, RISC V CPUs. Western Digital uh, a couple of years ago said that they will be putting out 1 billion RISC V cores in, in their products, like hard risks. And they are a big player in the RISC V space nowadays. Uh, I'm probably forgetting to mention some very important names here, but uh, yeah, th these what, are some of the big ones. What, what's the main driver? I mean, it, it, I, I can understand risk price from an open source perspective, and I, I think it's great that it gains uh, traction. But what surprises me is that you see a majority of sort of closed implementations where you have ARM, where, where it, you could just pick it up and it's established and, and it's, it's matured over a much longer period of time. Yeah, so there are different ways to answer that. And one thing is that RISC-V uh, allows you uh, to customize the CPU, which is not something you're allowed to do in the same way with ARM. Uh, so you you can add and, 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 and sometimes even remove instructions uh, and make it tailor your... It's very much your use case uh, while still having this shared body of, of software so you don't have to you, it's kind of like doing your own isa in a way but but with the support but existing support in in the, in the tooling and everything around it uh, so it's a very good compromise in that regard this is basically more flexibility does the whole china us trade war trump thingy play in as well to create a perfect storm because it feels to, like it's correlating that that risk five really takes off when when the export restrictions start to enter the picture, uh, from my point of view, it 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 was already on a on a on a trajectory before this uh, became a thing. Uh, 
but also last year uh risk five foundation uh was um turned into risk five international and changed its base from from us to switzerland uh to take away some of the worries uh because they they wanted to show that this was a truly global thing uh so they wanted a more uh, seemingly more neutral uh base for that so yeah and i also think one thing that's very interesting is that uh the european processor initiative uh, they chose to standardize around first arm and then risk five and a little later after that uh, also ibm open sourced their power uh, architecture and i i kind of wonder if if this was the thing that they didn't want to be left out as, as uh, from from these kind of projects um but i don't know i don't have any evidence for that i mean if you look at the software world it feels like open source is slowly eating the world so i guess once once risk 5 gets a foothold it, it it's very hard to stop yeah that's the thing so uh, uh it, it's it, it's commoditization so people don't people want to to stand on top of the shoulders of a giant they don't want to continuously reinvent everything from tooling to to simple ip cores like uart and sbi controllers and, and things like that they want to add their the value add on, on top of, of something existing so it makes a lot of sense to reuse and share all the commonality because very few companies sell compilers for example uh so it's so much better to just use an existing compiler uh, very few companies actually sell CPUs or processors. Uh, most companies just use a processor for some kind of computation, uh, and they are they can they don't have any exact demands. Perhaps they can just pick one of many existing. And many do choose open source CPUs. Like uh, Claire Wolf's uh, PCR with thirty two is extremely uh, common uh, in many uh, cases, and there are some smaller CPUs as well. Yeah, I mean, I've made one that has zero users, so we're the smallest, at least. <laughs> a jam CPU. I think it was back in 2001 or something. <laughs> it was an interesting was... experience. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, it, it's really fun. And it's. Um, I think it's good, even if I work with software these days, it's good to have that intimate knowledge of how it actually works. Um, uh, but I was thinking, so, so we've talked a bit about the, the, the closed source part, and I, I, I want to lead into your open source implementation, but I guess maybe we should, how, are there many open source implementations? And sort of how does the ecosystem look there? Yeah, uh, there are many open source implementations. I would say there are hundreds of open source implementations. And this is also a difference. I mean, I started out with the open risk world, where we had one reference implementation for like 15 years, and then we had another, which started taking over and then there was a third maybe a fourth but when it comes to risk five there are just so many implementations so you can basically choose the one that, that fits you fits you best uh, and you can check out on risk5.org uh, they actually have a list of known um, implementations both uh, proprietary ones and, and open source ones but, but of course you should pick the serve one or serve yes. five or however you pronounce it. <laughs> what what yeah, so, it apart from the rest? What, what's what made you reinvent the wheel once again? <laughs> yeah, so so the thing is, so I I I, I have made a CPU. I made a Risk Five CPU, and it's the world's smallest Risk Five CPU. Uh, I'm very proud of it, and it's it's surprisingly useful for different kind of things. But the thing is that uh so in, in 2018, um I was organizing Orconf in, in Gdansk, in Poland. Uh, and it was announced that there would be a Risk V soft CPU contest. So you should do the fastest or the smallest one uh, under some constraints. You should fit on a certain uh, kind of FPGA board. And you had two, mo two months to do that. And I thought, that sounds fun. I will never have time to do that. Uh, <laughs> I have too much stuff going on. So about a month later, I was doing the dishes, I remember, and I thought, hmm, I wonder, I wonder how a bit serial CPU works. Can you, like, do it one bit at a time? And I just had to jolt down some stuff on the paper. And I thought, hmm, this, is, this might work. So a couple of days later, I, I uh, started just writing some log to see if, if it would work even outside of the paper. Uh, and that's how we got started. So in about a month uh, of, of evenings and weekends, 
uh, I had with three three hours left to the deadline. I had uh, a, a working CPU uh, that that uh, fulfilled the requirements. Uh, last things were kind of fixing up interrupt support, um, so it could run the Zephyr operating system, which is really cool, a small uh, real time operating system. So I, I sent it in and then kind of forgot about it. And then like a month later at the Risk Five Summit, I wasn't there, but I, I got some some tweets saying, "Hey, you won!" <laughs> so it turns out I had I didn't win the smallest or, or the fastest uh, award, but I won the most award for the most creative uh, core. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. So then then I kind of realized there were so many things I did not have time because it was just a rush job. Uh, so over the years, since then, uh, this past one and a half year, I have made it smaller, basically. And now it's the world's smallest risk five CPU. But the target then is to, uh, is it to reduce the number of LUTs in a, in a soft scenario or, or for power consumption or what would? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very much about size. So, I mean, if you need something small and soft, then I'm your guy. Um, <laughs> Microsoft went well, so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is next level then, yeah. but it's um, how what kind of performance are we looking at? Is it like hundreds of megahertz, or and how how can can you even compare megahertz between different implementations? I guess it's different cycle counts depending on yeah. construction, depending on implementation as well. Yeah, so so this is very much a size for for service, very much a size uh, versus uh, speed uh, trade off. So uh, I I made a. A movie last year, uh, which uh, describes this in, in better detail. But basically, uh, a regular CPU, you you work on a whole instruction word at once. So you work on, on 32 bits at once. When you do an addi addition, uh, it will take one clock cycle, for example. Uh, for serve, you do it one bit at a time. So to do a 32 bit addition, it will take you 32 clock cycles. And this is a problem if you want a fast CPU, but in many cases, you actually don't need a fast CPU. If you're just doing, for example, if you're doing some sensor readings, you might read a temperature sensor once a second. You absolutely have no use for, for, <laughs> for anything <laughs> faster than that. Uh, and it, it runs fine. You can, you can run a simple retail operating system. Uh, and also some, some very interesting uh, things I heard about from users of serve is that when they're doing FPGA implementations, they choose serve because since it's so small and so simple, it's a lot faster to compile than other CPUs. So the turnaround times for, for, for testing out new things go from minutes to just like 20 seconds. This is a, <laughs> uh, is it kind of innovation that opens up that you didn't think of initially. Uh, so, and I, Another thing I wanted to do now when I had serve and, and I realized you could you could put a lot of serves into into FPGAs. So I created something called Core Score, which is a benchmark for FPGAs and for the FPGA tooling. And it basically tests how many serve cores you can fit into uh, a single FPGA. And uh, how, the, how the, many can you fit? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it depends on. <laughs> Depends on the FPGA. Uh, some, some smaller uh, lattice size 40 boards, you get like 10 cores into it. Uh, uh, the biggest one I have right now is, is a larger Silinx device, which is able to fit 5,087 cores in it. I think that's probably the most risk five cores on a single chip. It's pretty cool. Do you know how many microblazes they can fit in on the same? How much smaller is it than? <laughs> oh, it's probably a lot smaller than, than a microblaze. Um, I don't know how it compares to Pico Blaze. Uh, Pico Blaze, I think that might be 8-bit also. But the, the thing here is that you... So what I think you should compare it to instead is, is more like 8051s or, or uh, old 8-bit CPUs, because there are a lot of these old 8-bit CPUs in use uh, because they are small. But the tooling around those are absolutely a disaster. So with Serve, you can use just regular GCC and your, your ordinary build tool chain, uh, but you still don't have to pay for for a big uh, cpu in terms of gates yeah how does it look in the other end of the spectrum i mean we, we've seen the apple m1 so, so i yep. got myself a pinebook pro and then apple released their arm machine which is a crazy powerhouse and mine is kind of slow how how far in the other direction can you go in, in with risk 5 and the open source implementations uh 
I don't have the open the first open source implementation. I don't know. Uh, I do know that the the Boom CPU uh, by Chris Celio and others um, that has been traditionally a very fast CPU. It's an out of order uh, CPU. Uh, I know that Ariane is a 64-bit uh, Linux capable CPU that is becoming increasingly popular. Uh, it is now Ariane has been adopted by the Open Hardware Group and is now called CVA6, I think. Uh, I think the old name was better. Um, and um, then we have, of course, Western Digital Course, uh, the Swerve EH1. That was at the time when they released it last year, I think, two years ago. Uh, it was the fastest 32 bit. Uh, CPU. It, it had like a, a crazy good core mark score, uh, something like close to Xeon uh, for, for, for certain use cases uh, with title coupled memory. Um, so this, these are the ones. And then also, it's, it's not open source, but uh, a small company called Micromagic just released a, a 5 gigahertz uh, RISC V core. I've been talking to Dr. Andy Wang, uh, who's behind that recently. With, Planning to do something about the fastest and the smallest risk five cores kind of a joint thing. Well, that's cool. So, so then you can go like multi scalar out of order all the way on the same ISA that you do a uh, 32 cycle add. Uh, and, and you could basically, I guess, you can support all the instructions in software on the serve. So, so you can be software compatible all the way through, or, or do you have to like recompile and then it's upwards compatible only? Uh, yeah. So yeah, you could, you could emulate, uh, you could emulate missing instructions on risk five, everything. I think the atomic operations, you can't emulate all of them. That is, I, I read it in the spec somewhere. Um, yeah. Uh, but other than that, yes, you should be able to emulate probably very slowly, but still, uh, so serve already uh, emulates uh, multiplication and division, which is not part of the basic instruction set, but you could go further. You could emulate floating point and, in and vector instructions if, if so inclined. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> it's just a matter of time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but then I guess it's a bit like the uh, back with Amigas and Ataris, where if you had an FPU or if you didn't have an FPU, you got an interrupt and, and then the operating system or the C library or whatever took over and and did the actual calculation for you in software. Yeah, CPU exactly. So I, I didn't see it. It just sees an unknown instruction. And... Yeah, and it makes it a known thing. <laughs> it gives yeah. you a known uh, answer back. So yeah, I think what risk is, is the, the, especially the, the base instruction set specification is beautifully written. It's it's a work of art. Um, it, it's, it's very simple. It's also very versatile. And it was always designed with the intention to be extended uh, and that that works. Of course, there are some areas where, where you didn't anticipate it, some needs, uh, or but but mostly it, it it scales very well. Do do you think that Risk Five will sort of replace ARM over time, or will ARM take over and and, and become the desktop CPU now, and Risk Five becomes the embedded one? <laughs> I think that we have seen that it's it's very hard to break into new domains. So currently, uh, ARM has has a stronghold over the whole embedded market. Uh, MIPS used to have uh, a good market cap in in, uh, in network equipment, uh, but MIPS is just a sad story of, of, of greed and <laughs> the licensing that went wrong. Um, uh, x86 has been the traditional desktop CPU, and it has been up until ARM uh, and, and Apple. It has not been, nothing has been able to move that um, and in, in the in the high performance space I don't know that much I think power and x86 are, are battling it out there uh, also some arm um, so I think I think these are really are different battlefields and even when it comes to embedded uh, it's the high-end embedded and the low-end embedded so if in a CPU or no in a mobile phone for example you probably have a hundred different CPUs you have a CPU in your battery you have a CPU that takes care of button pressures, you have CPUs in, in your monitors and in your audio equipment and in power management and everywhere. And I think that more and more of these low-end CPUs will be replaced by RISC-V CPUs, and it will crawl up from there. And then it will come a matter of, hey, we're already using RISC-V in most of these. Why don't we use 
with five in the rest of them and to, that together with more and more capable cores uh, i think it it will slowly take over um that is my prediction uh, on desktop space I, I don't know i i'm not sure how many i'm not sure actually who uses desktop computers anymore i do but that's kind of because i'm work with <laughs> all of us and sit in front of yeah. a desktop machine but yeah <laughs> I mean, what, what's interesting to me is that, I mean, we, we had the whole Wintel thing going on for, what is it, 30, 40 years, and now it feels like the browser's sort of broken the win part of it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Intel also loses the foothold, because when I work, 90% of what I do is actually web-based. I mean, email meetings, whatnot, so I don't really care uh, about the CPU, and then Apple is sort of proving that if you don't have the, the Windows compatibility to worry about, it's quite easy to port. And and if the porting's been done once and you have the same tooling, I guess you have Clang support and so on in, uh, for, for Risk Five. then the next transition is a lot less painful, so to speak. Yeah, and speaking of first transitions, I think uh, ARM, I, I mean, Risk Five has been seen as the biggest threat to ARM in, in many ways, but I think, ironically, it was it's what ARM did that actually uh, paved the way for Risk V, uh, because in ten or twenty years ago, a lot of of, of open source software and closed source software was completely x86 centric, and then people started using Linux on 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 smaller devices, and and then you suddenly had to make sure that it it worked on on more than one platform, and once you have more more than one platform, it's much easier to add yet another platform. Uh, so a lot of the um, device or platform agnostic work that has been done for supporting ARM has greatly benefited Risk V, I would say. It'll be fun next decade. <laughs> it's, it, it feels much more unsure than 10 years ago. I mean, somehow I was too young in the early 80s where we had this sort of multi-actors uh, ecosystem, but we're getting back there. Feels fun. Yeah, it's. it's I, I agree. It, it will be very interesting to see, and, and I think I think ARM will will go strong for a while. Um, I'm not sure now that Nvidia is looking to buy them um, because I don't see Nvidia being all that interested in in the licensing model. I think Nvidia is more buying. Uh, arm for for the ai stuff and, and maybe other type i mean arm is not just about the cpu it's they have the um, axi uh, bus specification they have a lot of lot of other ips um so we, we'll see uh, yeah that's I an interesting know. move definitely <laughs> yeah it is I'm, I'm thinking for myself here the there's tons of like hacker heroes um in software like uh, Kernigan, Ritchie, Thompson, Stallman, etc. Do you have any key hacker hero kind of style in open hardware, open silicon? Yeah, we we definitely have that, and uh, I, I kind of feel bad for not mentioning people, but I think uh, one person that should be mentioned is, is Claire Wolf. Uh, she has she has done very much work on on opening up the. EDA side of the the, the tooling, uh, being the first to document these uh, uh, lattice size forty chips, which kind of paved the way for others to do the same thing. And she was not alone; that she she is very much uh, forerunner here. Also, she's done lots of things in formal verification, uh, which is interesting, but then a whole <laughs> whole different story. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, we have people like I mean, I always bit Star Trek when I meet Dave Patterson. Uh, he's, he's he's the mastermind behind and Risk and and, uh, and things like that. Um, of course, there, there there are a lot of people. Uh, <laughs> um, it's very very hard to, to mention. I would like to mention everyone in, in, in Fossi Foundation who has been working with for for ten years now, uh, who are doing a lot every day to to improve the situation on open source silicon. And many of these people are are not seen. And I I kind of a bit against also this this hero worshiping thing. Even if if some people have done a lot of things, uh, it is more that that people are helping out each other. Uh, some work in the background. Some are very I mean, I like to be seen, so I I am seen <laughs> a lot. <laughs> uh, but but other people don't don't enjoy that as much. 
Do you, if you want to start out with like free software, open source development, uh, a good tip is you can do like look into document stuff, solve an easy bug, or report a bug in a proper way. How do I? How can I engage in open hardware, open silicon? Yes, there are a few different ways. I think you should reach out uh, to us in Fuzzy Foundation. We have um, a chat room. We have mailing lists. Uh, then, then you can ask people. Uh, think about what more exactly you are interested in. Are you interested in, in making things move? Are you interested in, in, in uh, yeah, what areas you can, you can help in? We are also participating in Google Summer of Code. Uh, not sure we're getting this year, but we've been for the past four or five years. Um, I mean, of my personal projects, I would recommend starting out with uh, projects led to believe. Just seeing uh, that that you can make a, a lead blink and, and then take it from there and experiment and make it blink faster, make two leads blink and, and things like that. And you, suddenly, you have a whole risk five core. Uh, <laughs> so, so that is uh, this, this step is surprisingly small, I would say, actually. Cool. Um, cool. So uh, that that is one thing. Also. Um, Tim Ansel uh, works at Google. He is a great voice in this community, and he's always trying to get more software people in, involved. And he has he's a whole list of, of things um, uh, that that he, he he recommends things that people can can work on if, if they are new in this domain. Also, the Fossey Foundation YouTube channel. We have all the presentations from all our events recorded there, uh, so it could be a good source of inspiration uh, if you want to get a bit more feel uh, for what's going on. Yeah, there will be a link in, in one of the corners. I'm not sure where on the screen I show up, but yeah. <laughs> we, we will definitely link to that one. Perfect. So I know that you had one last question, Henrik. Uh, I, I have a few, but let's see. The, um, the, what I'm seeing here, and in in software development is i'm seeing sort of like the i don't know how to phrase this and not setting people up but there are some areas in software where you can say have you reloaded the page and you can get away with an error whereas in some other areas where, where i usually am uh, in the embedded world there's no way you can say, can you reboot or whatever? So there's like, there I say, sloppy programming and perhaps the uh, quicker or uh, quicker programming and the fail safe programming. Do you have any like divisions like that in uh, open hardware, open silicon, or is it you have to be 100% all the time? No, so this is. Uh... If you talk about if you're talking to people who have been around for doing ASIC stuff, especially in big companies and so on, they know that if you get the ship wrong, it's extremely expensive. And I've been I've been working in places where ships have gone wrong, uh, and it, it, it's it's very complicated and it's very expensive to redo. So these are some of these people are extremely paranoid about uh, uh, making sure that everything works. Um, sometimes they they aren't very efficient in, in actually doing that. Uh, it, it can be more for them, for their own uh, feeling of safety. Uh, and but then, then also we have standards like in automotive space we have ISO two six two six two, which which puts high demands on on uh, things should not go wrong, and when they go wrong, you should always know why they went wrong. Things like that. Um, so th there is a, there is a different safety culture and and and. and, and and tolerance against errors in, in the hardware and the software space. But then we have FPGAs, which is kind of the middle ground here. Uh, if you have an FPGA in a system where you can access remotely, uh, you can probably upload it. You can probably update it, just like it would with, with other kind of, of firmware. Uh, so that is, but then it's more like a software problem. But of course, if it's in an engine in a car, which you don't have network access to, then, then it doesn't matter if it's reprogrammable for, because you won't go out and and, <laughs> and reprogram every single car in existence. So uh, it, it, the harder it is to fix and the longer time it takes to fix it, the, the more paranoid you are about errors, I would say. But it's the same with software as well. If you send something out to space, it's not like, ah, yeah, we take this satellite down and just fix this thing and <laughs> launch it again. 
even if you count. Go up and press the reset button. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, there's been some kind of open risks in space, if I remember yes, correctly. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So open risk. I mean, that this is risk five is, is a better instruction set in, in most regards. Um, but uh, I think one thing that 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 happened with risk five was was the perception uh, that changed. So. I know a lot of places where there are open risk CPUs, like in, in critical telecom infrastructure. There's one on ISS, apparently, and there has been one in satellites and in, in, in digital TVs and in, in Zigbee controllers and everywhere. Uh, but no one talked about it. N you would not find anyone who said this publicly. Oh, it's in tablets, ox, 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 from, from all winner. Um, and then Risk Five came along, and everyone was, "Hey, look at us! We're using Risk Five. Check it out!" Mm -hmm. And they made it into a press release. So this is this is very ultimately a very good thing, although a bit frustrating when, when we <laughs> had been working on kind of <laughs> basically the same thing, and then let's uh, the world just yeah. It's, it's like I'm trying to push a train forward for for many years, and then suddenly it just takes off, and now, now I'm trying to keep up with it instead. Well, that sounds really good. I mean, it's we have the pivot. Definitely, and the next decade will be very interesting, I think. Yeah, I think so. Uh, we ha now we have the, the technical underpinnings, uh, and now we need to see. I think there will be very interesting things happening in, in, the, um, uh, in the ecosystem around this, with companies forming that uh, take open source solutions and build customized services around it, uh, all these things that we have in the software ecosystem where you can just start a company by, by an ID and don't have to pay tools for like hundreds and thousands of dollars. You can just get going. Cool. Well, it sounds like we need to do an annual follow-up on this one. Uh, but I think that's a, that's a good pivot to sort of to conclude for today. But thank you for these two episodes. It's, it's been fun. And uh, I hope people find it interesting as well, since open hardware is very close to, to open source and open software, but still slightly different. Yeah, we're not welcome anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah, thank, thank you, you for having and, me. Uh, so, so let's book February 10th uh, in one year, hopefully without COVID. Perfect. It's Ooh. a date. <laughs>